would you have mentioned about the the, the your the um your view on when to operate on this uh, cavernoma bleed you know you said them um, within 10 to 12 days but when you see somebody young patient with a brainstem cavernoma um perhaps after the after a, a first bleed would you operate i mean this is a very typical question in cavernoma talks that's so right it's not want you to know your view on it whether you operate wait for the second bleed or whether you for the whether you go ahead with the, after the first bleed what do you think yeah, uh, I can tell you that uh, I never really understood the condition of two bleeds uh, before surgery. Uh, if the patient uh, bled once and has some deficit, which uh, you may in cavernoma expect uh, will improve, and if the cavernoma is accessible, I do not wait for the second bleed. I operate after the first bleed. Yeah. I think that that's very um, clear answer. And and the one point I think from this talk we all um, gathered was that um, when there is an associated venous anomaly, that's not to touch it um, and, and did not, did not disturb the venous drainage of this um, cavernomas. Is that right? Yeah. Um, there's one more thing which I just wanted to clarify. You know, you have several patients who are on regular follow-up. So, is that the policy for all the cavernomas? Do you ever discharge these patients at all? Uh, you mean uh, if I discharge the patient and follow them up? Yeah, so if you, somebody you, you don't think about operating, will you follow them up for long term? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, definitely. 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 Yeah. We, we start with a, a yearly follow-up. Then after three years, we prolong it to each three years MR. And the patient uh, must be very well informed that in uh, any, anything, he doesn't feel normal, he picks up the phone and gives a, give us a call. So we really yeah. follow our, our patients very closely. Long very long. closely. This is a dynamic disease. Yeah. And you cannot let the patient uh, just dis disappear. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, there's one more thing before I uh, go on to the, the question from the uh, audience. Um, what is your view on, there are some units and centers around the world trying gamma knife for this lesion. What is your view on it? <laughs> uh, the, the, the best series I have seen uh, of gamma knife for cavernomas was that uh, at the end, as a conclusion, then claimed that they decreased uh, the risk of bleeding down to the uh, frequency of uh, uh, lower cavernomas in brainstem cavernomas down to one percent per year. I didn't believe it much. It was not really well proven. And yeah. uh, actually, I do not see any place for radio surgery in cavernomas because what you expect is in AVMs is hyperplasia of the vessel wall, which occludes the wall. But what can you expect uh, uh, to happen with one single layer of the wall of cavernoma? You can expect nothing. And uh, as of now, I haven't seen a single cavernoma case which would disappear after radio surgery. So we do not even offer the patients the radio surgery only if they ask actively for it. Yeah. I don't see any place for radio surgery no, in government. I agree. I totally agree. And um, so I just want to go through some of the questions. I think you have answered many of the questions during your talk. What is your approach of to the cavernomas causing epilepsy, which you have covered? So I will skip it. And there's a question about how to differentiate cavernoma uh, from a CT and MR. And obviously, the MR are uh, quite typical appearance. You get you can use gradient echo to, to differentiate the cavernoma. And uh, there's one question about the veins during cavernoma surgery. How can we differentiate which vein should be cauterized in cavernoma surgery? So you want mm -hmm. to answer that, Vladimir? Mm -hmm. uh, epilepsy surgery. Uh, you, you know, there is a general neurosurgical law that you can always get back and do more. You can never get back and do less. So in majority of cases, who come to us come directly. And if they are epileptic patients, 
then we first resect the cavernoma only, and only in case that the seizures are intractable and continue, then we have the epileptic uh, workup, and then we go ahead as epilepsy surgery. Uh, whenever possible, we do not start with epilepsy surgery first, because you know all those epileptologists, they want you to resect this part of brain and another part of brain, and yet this part of brain, because there are some spikes. So we first resect the lesion and wait. Yeah. And the next question were the uh, veins. Yeah. Yeah. Veins, uh, especially in brainstem cavernomas, not in lower cavernomas, in brainstem cavernomas is something I very carefully look for at the beginning uh, at, on the MRs. I really seek them actively. And even during surgery, I look for the veins. And whenever there is some vein, I do not coagulate it at any cost. I really preserve it at any cost. I, these veins uh, drain the normal brain. If you occlude them, you have a venous infarction. So any vein in the vicinity of the cavernoma or even on the surface of the cavernoma must be preserved. This is what I really strongly believe. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I think that is probably all the questions. Um, you've covered everything. Thanks, um, Vladimir. That's been a great talk. Um, we'll, Thank you. Uh, unless, um, Professor Jaburaji, you want to ask anything? Well, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. I think uh, one important uh, uh, thing in discussion, which Vlad has uh, uh, to a large extent uh, talked about, is that uh, when you operate on a cavernoma for epilepsy, would you uh, just do a uh, resection or would you like would you do it like an epilepsy surgery? The epilepsy groups seem to be of a consensus that unless the epilepsy has been frequent and has been the duration has been more than two years, then probably you should use electrophysiology and other uh, parameters. Uh, if the duration of epilepsy is shorter, probably just a lesionectomy is good enough. So there is some kind of a time correlation, it seems, apart from uh, other things. And it is probably strongly related to the hemosiderin uh, around the lesion. So if you are operating for epilepsy, you make a special kind of a effort to get the hemosiderin ring out, apart from uh, just removing the lesion. I think that's, that's the only thing I wanted yeah. to add. Chandra, I fully agree with you, but uh, we fortunately have a health care system where the MR is on any corner, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are getting patients with epileptic seizures really within, <laughs> within two years, so uh, these are not, uh, uh, I, I, as of now, I have not seen a cavernoma patient with epilepsy who would be coming to us, let's say, in five or six years uh, uh, after the treatment for epilepsy. So in this, we are probably lucky. And uh, I fully agree with you that uh, if it's a longer lasting epilepsy, intractable epilepsy, then the hemosiderin uh, uh, surroundings must go out. Sure, sure. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so it, with great pressure, I'm going to invite Professor Chandrasekhar Diopurajiri. He's a well-known um, neurosurgeon and is the chairman of the WM Endoscopy Committee. And uh, Professor Diopurajiri is going to talk on craniopharyngeum, which is another great topic. A um, so, um, lot of controversies about craniopharyngeumas and, and the, the, um, our own views on this. So I'm very interested to hear this. Um, thank you, Professor Diopurajiri. Well, like uh, uh, Vlad said that uh, for cavernoma, what is probably important is uh, uh, decision making and second, of course, is the approach. Decision making has been a problem with craniopharyngiomas and approach has now become, I think, in the last few years, that is also being hotly debated. So, uh, actually, Salman has asked me to try and cover it comprehensively. So, I'm going a little bit into the uh, history, pathology, and some controversies before we get into the surgical uh, uh, domain. Basically, Cushing gave this name of craniopharyngioma and described as one of the most formidable of intracranial tumors. And the first successful resection was probably transphenoidal by Halstead in 1909. What is remarkable 
is that Donald Madsen has reported almost 32 cases in 1969, uh, most of them before steroid use and have shown a very good result, uh, which you often uh, wonder how, but there is long-term follow-up of his cases and it is undeniable that he has been able to achieve those kind of results. So if you have an idea about what is the nasal, uh, uh, the craniopharyngeal duct, it can originate along it anywhere. And you have some reports uh, where they have, it has been found in sinus, et cetera. But the most common is either sala or supracellar in the epithelial wrist from the craniopharyngeal duct. In WHO classification, it is a grade one tumor, a benign partly calcified epithelial tumor of cellar region, presumably derived from Rathke's pouch, is how it is described in the WHO atlas. And uh, they occur almost one to 3% of all brain tumors and about five to 7% in children in United States and probably a little more frequently in uh, Japan and uh, many parts of Asia. And uh, there is no predilection to uh, either male or female sex. In Nature, recently a review is published by the craniopharyngioma group, which uh, Muller from Germany heads. And uh, they have actually uh, said that it is a low histological malignancy rather than calling it benign because of the frequent nature of recurrence in these tumors. If you look at the histopathology, you find two definite types. One is called adamantum nomatous type or what is called ACP now, and the papillary type, or what is called PCP now. And they have some distinct uh, features that the adamantinomatous uh, uh, craniopharyngioma is more common in children. Though it has a bimodal age incidence, it can happen in children and it can happen in fifth decade. While uh, papillary craniopharyngiomas are usually adult presentation, solid morphology. And recently, a, a mutation has been found which is a BRAF somatic mutation in papillary, while it is a CTNNB uh, beta catenin mutation in uh, the adamantinomatous type. Morphologically, these three varieties, I think uh, all of us know, predominantly cystic, predominantly solid with some calcification, and a mixed variety, which is the most common, of course. There are distinct differences between craniopharyngiomas in children and adults like you would find that signs of raised intracranial pressure are, are more seen in children while visual field defects is the common presentation in adults. Presence of hydrocephalus you see in about 40 to 50% of uh, children while it is much less around 10 to 20% in adults. And again, as we initially talked, the adamantinomatous variety is more common in children. Uh, we already talked about mutation and many of the children present with endocrinological deficit uh, while the adults may have mild deficits, but these are not usually manifest and very few of them present with endocrinological uh, manifestations. Calcification is common in children, not so common in adults, and uh, the gross total resection is probably higher in uh, children according to this particular uh, paper, but I think uh, it really depends on morphology and various other factors as we'll talk about. In terms of clinical presentation, I think the most common, as we said, uh, is the neuro-ophthalmological presentation, bitemporal hemianopia being the most common presentation. And you can have other kinds of uh, uh, field defects also, depending on the location of the lesion. And typically, a retrochiasmal lesion or an intraventricular lesion would not produce a field defect, but essentially present with papilledema and raised intracranial pressure. Neuroendocrinological disturbances, as we just talked about, are more common in children and the most common, almost 90% patients would have uh, some endocrinological disturbance. And uh, the GH deficiency seems to be the most common, seen in almost 75%. And one of the most common thing, which you see postoperatively, but usually is never present at the time of presentation, is diabetes insipidus. Less than 9% patients present with diabetes insipidus with craniopharyngioma. You look at other causes of uh, cellular supracellular lesion in children if they present with diabetes insipidus like a germinoma or histiocytosis rather than looking for a craniopharyngioma, which is a common complication though after surgery. As we just said that raised intracranial pressure is common in a retrochiasmal 
you do not typically present with uh, uh, field defect, but with papilledema, and also because of the associated hydrocephalus. Very rarely in adults, they can produce with psychological symptoms. And if there is a paracellular extension, it can present with motor deficits. The goal of surgery remains the same uh, in all patients, that is to improve vision, to decrease the intracranial pressure. And third, which is the most important thing for any brain tumor is cure from tumor with the uh, caveat that you must preserve a good functional status because most of them occur in growing children. And therefore, we look at uh, what is the general feeling about uh, uh, the surgical intervention or any intervention for that matter in craniopharyngiomas. And the Cochrane Review in 2007 actually uh, says that 44% people who are actively involved in treating these patients felt that intervention was likely to be beneficial. Uh, the papers, uh, uh, people who have written papers on this, 7% patient uh, people have predominantly talked about it is likely to be harmful. 49% said that evidence did not support either benefit or harm, and almost everybody recommended further research. A few more years have passed since then, but I have not seen a further analysis like this. But there have been several uh, issues coming out of uh, uh, journals and uh, uh, there are uh, consensus meetings, but I do not think there is a consensus. And the pendulum has swung from radical resection to more conservative approaches. Areas of controversy are therefore extent of surgical resection, the type of surgical approach and use of adjuvant therapy, which one and at what stage. We were very largely influenced by William Sweet, who visited our department during, the, uh, during our residency. And he was a great advocate of radical resection. And uh, he's, he's written up this uh, wonderful article as a lead article in uh, one of the clinical neurosurgery volumes, where it talks about there is a good gliatic plane around craniopharyngioma, and you can get most of them out because recurrences are more painful and more difficult to treat. I think uh, this is controversial and one of the uh, classifications which is based on site of origin and the growth pattern from Korea probably explains what is this uh, uh, kind of a good capsule is. Most of the time, like a pituitary adenoma, the capsule can be the stretched out diaphragm. So you can have a subdiaphragmatic uh, uh, kind of growth where the diaphragm remains intact. And usually these tumors go towards the prechiasmal uh, location and present with visual disturbances. When their diaphragm is incompetent, they probably go straight in the line of the stalk and they probably go into the third ventricle in the retrochiasmal direction. And uh, some remain restricted to uh, the sub subdiaphragmatic uh, uh, area and some remain completely supradiaphragmatic uh, uh, because they originate there. Sami's classification in terms of surgical approach uh, from grade one to grade five really depends on how uh, much it has grown and in which direction. And uh, he has based his surgical approaches on this. While Kasam has given a classification depending on the relation of this tumor to the pituitary stalk for a transphenoidal approach, uh, if it is in front of the infundibulum, behind the infundibulum, or infiltrating the infundibulum, and of course the uh, separate, uh, though it's a small number, a significant number of patients could have a third ventricular, entirely third ventricular tumor. One of the important things which has been emphasized by the Paris group is the hypothalamic involvement, which has become the largest determinant of resection uh, today. I think apart from MRI assessment of hypothalamus, which they have graded into grade 0, grade 1, and grade 2, where you can probably attempt a radical resection in grade 0, you can probably try it in type 1, but you will never try it in uh, type uh, 2. The most important thing is if anybody presents with hypothalamic uh, injury signs, you would certainly not uh, like to... Uh, uh, go for a radical resection, uh, that has been definitely proved to be hazardous. A more elaborate scheme has been proposed by this group of uh, surgeons from Madrid, Dresden, and uh, Pittsburgh. They have actually collected uh, 
as much information as possible from 500 cases, surgical autopsy and uh, MR findings, and have come to uh, have written out a paper earlier in Acta Neurochirurgica and later in uh, uh, Journal of Neurosurgery based on this material, which actually divides this into several uh, uh, kind of uh, class, uh, several kind of uh, tumors. Uh, you have uh, the three points which are important to make this classification are the location of the tumor in terms of where it is in relation to the stalk, the adherence of the tumor to the hypothalamus and to the stalk, and the quality of adherence. They, they have also tried to uh, put that as a feature and talked about the six different varieties and having different uh, or increasing difficulty and increasing uh, uh, chances of injury following surgery uh, in these kind of patients. And they have actually given very nice examples. Uh, apart from the fact that uh, uh, what is the relation, they also talk about how exactly is the morphology. Is it pedicle? Is it sessile, cap-like, ring-like, which is the worst variety probably uh, in their experience. And then how adherent it is loose, tight, fusion and replacement, which is the worst category where you should not ever attempt uh, or you are definitely going to lose the stock, especially if it is near the hypothalamic end of the stock. And they have actually correlated this with whatever was the outcome of this patient. And it seems to be uh, sort of supporting their view that uh, uh, this kind of classification may be useful though I think it is going to be extremely difficult and many a times it would depend on operative findings. So you need to be aware of this. There is a classification which has come recently from the Chinese uh, people also mainly uh, who are now shifting towards transphenoidal surgery and they have made it a simpler uh, classification saying that peripheral or central in terms of location with the stock and then is it near the hypothalamic end? Is it near the cellar end? Or is it somewhere in the middle? And that determines what is the... So basically, I think if you look at evidence-based guidelines, there is very little as to what should be done in these patients. And therefore, most of the literature is evidence-based individual decision-making, which we'll be talking about. Earliest evidence that uh, radiation works on these uh, relatively benign tumors was way back in 1951. And uh, they showed that radiation inhibits formation of cystic fluid even when administered in small dosages. And by 1968 or so, all the patients who were not uh, under, uh, who did not go radical resection started receiving radiation. And now we have uh, significant data about total resection versus subtotal resection uh, and the uh, arm of subtotal excision with uh, radiotherapy, which clearly shows that five-year and 10-year survival is, though it is very good in uh, total resection, the subtotal excision with radiotherapy also probably gives you similar results uh, in these patients. There are uh, meta-analysis uh, uh, in this uh, century which talk about uh, comparison of tumor control with various treatment strategies. And again, over 440 two patients who underwent tumor resection, it has been shown that two-year and five-year uh, um, rates of uh, uh, progression-free survival rates are almost similar in gross total resection and subtotal resection versus radiotherapy group. This, this is particularly important in pediatric craniopharyngioma and purely pediatric patients have been studied Almost 109 studies have been taken by Nalin Gupta and his group. And out of these 531 patients, again, you have a similar kind of statistic that 84 versus 76% patients uh, have done quite well. So the difference is very, very uh, marginal. And uh, the problem with all this data is that the data talks about uh, progression-free survival rates and uh, data talks about uh, mortality. Uh, mortality. The Sears focus on mortality statistics therefore limits its utility for studying a tumor like craniopharyngioma, which is a relatively benign tumor. And outcomes uh, when the survival rates are fairly high, the quality of life is what matters. And that does not uh, 
uh, sort of uh, show up in the uh, seer data and therefore uh, there is a criticism of this kind of data being used to make treatment decisions so if we talk about surgical approach we have sailor tumors which are approached usually through the transnasal route either microscopic or endoscopic intraventricular tumors will be approached by the transcranial intraventricular approach either microscopic or endoscopic again depending on your preference however the suprasalar tumors depending on which direction they are going require a greater degree of individuality and the concept of dural dome probably can play a role in this we saw this figure earlier when i talked about the korean concept of taking the diaphragm along like the pituitary adenoma takes however large the tumor becomes it probably takes uh, stretches the diaphragm around and therefore all tumors can be tackled through the transvenoidal approach however a lobulated tumor a tumor which has spread on the side obviously probably has ruptured the diaphragm and therefore it may be better tackled with uh, uh, transcranial approaches but before going into that i think uh, let us talk about another classification which is commonly made especially the uh, transcranial approaches have been first described for prechiasmal tumors where you can do either a bifrontal or a terianal craniotomy while and uh, this can be equally well tackled by the transnasal or the trans uh, uh, cranial approach while the retrochiasmal tumor which grows towards the lamina uh, the third ventricle where approaches like lamina terminalis or petrosal approaches which are either difficult or uh, which have greater morbidity uh, have been shown Uh, to probably be better approached by transvenoidal approach in recent studies and uh, even earlier studies have shown that there is a definite uh, difference between prechiasmal and retrochiasmal tumors in terms of mortality and morbidity uh, uh, several years ago so when you are approaching the tumor through the transcranial approach you have several corridors from where you can tackle the tumor the most common corridor which you use is the interoptic space if the tumor is not presenting here or if there is a prefix chiasm you can open the lamina terminalis or if the tumor is going more on one side you can actually tackle the tumor either through the uh, space between the carotid and the optic nerve or the optic nerve and the tentorium or the third nerve uh, we we wrote up about our lamina terminalis approach uh, some years ago which has given us very good uh, uh, results uh, however as i am will tell you over a period of time our approaches have also changed today transnasal surgery is mainly uh, done or almost always done for tumors which are limited to predominantly cella which are mostly cystic and infra diaphragmatic and that is how we started this is one typical example this is a young girl 16 year old who has presented with uh, a short stature and who has presented with visual deficit in terms of bitemporal hemianopia and this is the tumor you can almost see that probably the diaphragm is stretched here the regular stretching up words and this patient was treated with endonasal approach you can see the sphenoid being opened or i'm sorry you can see the uh extended approach where cella as well as plenum has been exposed then you can see that uh, the contents have first been uh, taken out and the wall of the cyst is now being uh, separated from uh, there is you can see the pituitary tissue behind this and the dense capsule of the tumor and eventually the whole cyst is coming out and the diaphragm is that uh, that what uh, i was going to wanted to show you and you can see that the diaphragm is intact and this is one of the rare cases where we have no csf leak uh you can see actually the three months uh, uh, follow up scan shows that probably the stock is intact the pituitary is seen enhancing nicely this girl had transient diabetes insipidus but at the end of 3 months 
she did not require that she must uh, she all, of course had to continue to take uh, her steroid and thyroid supplement as she was taking earlier and this is a recent uh, follow up scan which again shows you that uh, the stock is probably intact and uh, she is on a very small dose of uh, uh, steroid right now what we were talking about is the pre infundibular infundibular and uh, retro infundibular tumor by kasam's classification and they can be tackled through the endonasal approach this is this is a typical case this is again a young girl of 10 or 11 years old you can see that the uh, pituitary is plastered at the back and the tumor has gone uh, into the third ventricle and this is a typical retrochiasmal tumor this girl presented only with raised intracranial pressure uh, very little in terms of uh, visual field deficit again a large opening opening the plenum we are ligating the intercavernous sinus first by making incision on both sides then it is being coagulated after cutting this you can start seeing the uh, calcified part of the tumor which was in the cella we are trying to find the anterior limit though you cannot go on doing this because it is difficult to repair it then and you can see that the normal gland uh, normal pituitary gland is behind and this is where the tumor is coming out from and eventually it leads into the third ventricle and you can start seeing the aqueduct and uh, foramen of munro after the tumor removal is complete and this is the girl 3 years after surgery there is no residual tumor and uh, she has uh, managed uh, not to develop any obesity and uh, she is also on a small dose of steroids uh, uh, four or five years now after the surgery a recurrent craniopharyngeoma in an adult patient again you can see that uh, there is a predominantly cystic element and uh, uh, this this tumor was uh, tackled again by transphenoidal approach you can see the this is the part of the plenum that has been removed and uh, you can see when the top of the supracellular component of the tumor uh, the cyst is being taken out now it is being dissected of the you can see it is being dissected of the uh, pituitary stalk it is fairly adherent but it is possible to separate it and eventually you will find that the stalk is intact you can see the basilar quadrifurcation here and uh, you can see the stalk preserved fully third ventricle and in the interpeduncular fossa you can see this on the top you can see the top of the third ventricle which is intact and this is the post operative scan so it is possible to uh, do a good dissection and remove this in a pre infundibular tumor however in a trans infundibular tumor like this this is another girl uh, a nodule going back and you can see that you can hardly see a uh, pituitary stalk here though uh, it is possible to see the tumor cyst and it is it is very very adherent to the tumor we have managed to anatomically preserve this by doing sharp dissection from the stalk and uh, we have managed to save this uh, but uh, she she took almost a year before her ddavp could be stopped and uh, she is otherwise anterior pituitary function she requires hormonal supplement for almost everything though there is no premorbid obesity even in this girl Uh, which is uh, something which we have found in most of our patients operated by transphenoidal approach this is a patient where the stalk is virtually in between the two uh, cysts and therefore this we had to operate by a trans clival approach we we had to take out dorsum cella uh, before we could reach this in the interpeduncular fossa and then this has been completely excised this is about 7 years post operative follow up and uh, she is doing well with hormonal supplements of uh, corticosteroids and thyroxine uh, but again no diabetes insipidus fortunately 
if you have an intraventricular tumor it is possible again to use endoscopic method or a microscopic method this is a typical example this is a completely uh, what i thought was a uh, intraventricular tumor sometimes it is difficult to know if uh, it is insinuating from the supracellular area or not and you you really need to carefully assess that but this patient had no visual deficit and i thought that it was probably better to remove it through the foron of monroe which was enlarged and this is a microscopic approach uh, and uh, after the contents of the cyst wall has been removed now the whole cyst wall has been almost completely excised and you can see the floor of the third ventricle without any uh, tumor remnants in this patient however it was possible to do it endoscopically we first perforated all the cyst walls and then uh, did a image guided uh, sorry endoscope guided surgery to remove it completely in a larger tumor which has cystic component we have used combined approach and like this patient will first uh, tap the cyst and remove the cyst fluid uh, let the patient get better from signs of raised intracranial pressure and within a week or so we go for the second stage we will we will we'll do a trans nasal approach and uh, remove this tumor we feel that it makes it easier uh, to separate the tumor from the third ventricular floor because once the cyst is drained uh, probably it is easier to do that and we have found that our hypothalamic dysfunction rate has uh, uh, come down remarkably and we have been able to achieve a more complete excision this is the uh, reservoir which was left behind earlier and this is the patient 3 uh, months later and it is almost 5 years follow up now a recent systematic uh, review of the uh, endonasal surgery outcomes in pediatric craniopharyngioma have shown that the results are probably superior to traditional means of transcranial resection especially the endocrinological deficits are less and uh, to reconstruct these patients is also not so difficult we have recently written up uh, two papers on this and not an advertisement but uh, uh, we have also published a book on uh, our technique recently uh craniotomy for giant craniopharyngiomas is probably necessary when you have a tumor going so much uh, into the paracellular area it is not possible to remove it transphenoidally so predominantly paracellular tumor if there is heavy calcification if there is vascular encasement if there is a previous vascular injury and i have had burnt my the only uh, mortality we have had in our series in craniopharyngiomas in a previously radiated patient where we had a carotid injury uh, while trying to do uh, resect the tumor out from behind so this is a tumor this kind of a tumor i prefer still to do a terional approach for this a uh, lateral frontal approach if you want to call it dissect the sylvian fissure widely you can start seeing the tumor and then you can use the various corridors which we showed earlier uh, we are removing this tumor first from the interoptic corridor then from the you can see that uh, that it is coming out from the branches of the carotid now so uh, it is a lateral corridor lateral to the carotid now now you can see that it is coming out between the carotid and the optic nerve and the last portion of the tumor which has gone into the interpeduncular fossa has been taken out and then you can bring in your endoscope just to make sure that you have been able to remove this tumor from many places you will find some specks of calcification in here, here and there but most of the capsule is out and we have been able to take this tumor out almost completely and you can actually see even on the opposite side and make sure that uh, uh, you have not left any uh, uh, capsule behind and you can see various corridors as i said and this is a post operative mri which showed a good excision now we'll talk about should we be giving upfront radiation or not in a minute uh, as soon as we finish this another reason why i would do a transcranial surgery like we i did in this young girl is because this was almost a ossified uh, kind of a tumor 
which i i would find it very difficult to uh well you can drill out uh, quite satisfactorily from the transphenoidal approach but you when you do not have a distal control if you are not sure if it is adherent to a vessel uh, i am not so confident and therefore a heavily calcified tumor i prefer to do transcranially and this is the post operative picture of this girl operated about 6 years ago and she has not had any further radiation another reason is this kind of a tumor this tumor is virtually straddling the optic chiasm and i am not sure uh, i'll be able to remove it uh, transphenoidally again here you can see i cannot see the optic nerve separately from the tumor this patient again we operated uh, uh, by transcranial uh, approach uh, and you can see that uh, there is a large calcified component of this tumor and i thought i was removing the tumor from lamina terminalis but by this time i realized that the optic nerve was virtually uh, divided and the tumor was coming out between the uh, fibers of the optic nerve and, and now the tumor is being separated from the hypothalamus you can start seeing a plane of cleavage and once you get a smooth glistening capsule then you know that you are not likely to damage the hypothalamus and here where there is a doubt i i would probably be a little conservative in uh, this is an adult patient and uh, mainly presented with visual symptoms uh, so uh, i i have uh, thought that uh, i must uh, uh, take out the capsule without damaging the hypothalamus and maybe some remnants may be there we are just checking again with the endoscope to make sure that we have not left any big chunks of uh, tumor anywhere and this is the post operative scan this lady improved reasonably well in the right eye but not so well in the left eye which was uh, badly affected pre operatively anyway the third reason is this is a patient which has come to me with a recurrent craniopharyngioma earlier surgery there was uh, transient hemiparesis and the cause is obvious she has lost her carotid uh, uh, here and uh, therefore when the patient came with a recurrence i decided to go transcranially again it is much easier to uh, save the vessels so basically what happens when you leave some tumors remnants behind and you find that the recurrence rate is almost 70% when a patient is followed up for almost 3 uh, uh, to 5 years and most of the recurrences occur within the first 3 years of surgery so what are the other modalities adjuvant radiotherapy either a, a stereotactic radio surgery or radiotherapy and what kind of radiotherapy uh, the role of local chemotherapeutic agents and i think we'll we'll just uh, go one uh, go through all the options radiation following sub total resection as we have seen seems to be certainly helping the patients and uh, we have 60% 20 year survival we have already seen almost 79% 10 year survival in these patients and if you look at uh, the meta analysis 32 papers and it shows that the disease control ranges from uh, almost 40 44 100% to but most studies have shown almost 90% uh, which have come up after the year 2000 complication rate there are certain complications uh, uh, radiation induced complications but the uh, severe complication rate is very low and uh, srs can be done only if the residual craniopharyngioma is less than 3 cm in size and not adherent to the optic pathways while the srt can be used uh, uh, for all kinds of cases if you look at radio surgery the results seem to be the same but again uh, the size of the tumor and its adherence to the optic uh, apparatus is an important feature same thing has come out with uh, this japanese paper again which has shown a longer term follow up uh, and showed that gamma knife surgery is equally good i have had only one patient treated post operatively with gamma knife a small nodule which was left which showed a uh, small uh, uh, growth over a period of one year and after the one year after surgery the patient underwent gamma knife surgery and the last follow up 9 years later showed a small calcific remnant 
uh proton beam therapy has come to india very recently we have had experience with this one patient uh, we have tried to do a transphenoidal surgery on this patient and in spite of uh, trying to as uh, you know remove the cyst once remove the tumor from the uh, chiasm quite well we found that dissection from hypothalamus was extremely difficult and patient was getting some disturbances and we have left some uh, tumor behind at the end of the surgery this patient was uh, subjected to proton beam therapy and one of the big advantages it seems that this is a scan 6 months later and you virtually have no tumor remnant seen here and the pituitary stalk can be seen well this patient again is free from diabetes insipidus though he has other uh, adeno hypophyseal hormone insufficiency i think at st jude's they are conducting a prospective trial which will probably uh, Uh, give us a better idea about long term uh, control with proton beam but it certainly seems to be working much faster than other modes of radiation however i am told in interim results they have found that the rate of vasculitis is probably slightly higher intracavitary treatment just to finish the uh, the treatment options uh, several drugs have been used we have some experience with bleomycin earlier in this patient i used bleomycin seven injections and the cyst remained quiet for about 2 years or so and then when it recurred again then i went for subtotal resection followed by radiotherapy uh the meta analysis has not shown uh, one way or the either they they have talked about high quality uh, but most important reason why bleomycin has been given up is because of toxicities to the surrounding structure so you need to have a leak proof cyst which is very difficult to have on the other hand the newer drug the uh, alpha interferon seems to be fairly safe and we have had some good results with in six cases with interferon the cyst has completely dried up in this patient and i have not had to treat this girl uh, several injections of interferon during her first uh, uh, admission on the other hand i'll just show you this is as the last case this patient a four and half years old girl who presented with raised intracranial pressure at another center they did a subtotal resection and then she did not follow up and then when i saw her she was predominantly with a single cyst and i decided to put interferon in this she uh, was quite uh, uh, she had a huge hormone deficiency which was corrected during this time she underwent uh, B, uh, alpha interferon therapy as per the toronto uh, uh, protocol and uh, after uh, this was the cyst reservoir insertion i won't go through that and then we did a dye study and then we started injecting at the end of 3 months you find that there is a more thick capsule now and the cyst has become largely decompressed we gave the option of either radiotherapy or surgery to the patient and should they opted to go for surgery so through the same tract from which the reservoir was placed we managed to just put a uh, retractor and uh, excise this uh, uh, cyst almost completely and you can see there is a small hole in the septum but the whole cyst has come out and you can see the post operative scan 3 months later so she has not been given radiation yet and we are probably waiting to see how uh, she progresses further basically i think uh, by transphenoidal surgery uh, way back in 90s uh, dr falbush has shown that uh, it does not increase the rate of uh, hypopituitarism uh, though this is the most common worry most people have he has shown 40% patients had before surgery and 42.9% after surgery and uh, it seems that radiotherapy and extent of tumor removal does not seem to influence endocrine outcome adults with craniopharyngioma were shorter had lower igf while patients uh, who had adult onset craniopharyngioma fared a little better so you have to be more careful in children but careful means what i think the only thing which has been definitive is that the overall survival as well as quality of life are impaired if patient shows any signs of hypothalamic involvement uh, pre operatively 
and in such patients you would not try to do a radical resection and you would probably use uh, radiation in these patients uh, this recent review in nature has again of the craniopharyngioma group has again talked about the same that progression free survival was better after complete resection but in terms of uh, quality of life i think a posterior hypothalamus sparing surgery is what is probably important in terms of molecular pathology i think the opportunity to treat these uh, recurrent tumors adenomatous tumor with beta catenin uh, uh, modulators they are still not uh, available uh, i think for clinical practice while braf mutation target therapy is possible and it has been successfully tried in these two cases uh, in boston so this is a overall experience we first used to do craniotomies in most of our patients lately it has uh, endonasal transpenoidal whenever possible and a combined approach whenever we have a large tumor is what we have and i think the most important thing we have found is that it has probably given us smoother post operative period and a uh, uh, better endocrinological outcome basically i think you have to individualize all craniopharyngiomas are not the same and uh, i do not know if you can do such a detailed assessment as has been described recently but you have to look for hypothalamic dysfunction signs and you have to look at the location and the morphology of the tumor before you decide how you are going to treat this patient and make the patient and the family aware that this is probably a lifetime disease and you need to probably follow up all your life thank you the excellent talk was brilliant uh, really enjoyed every bit of it uh, i'm not sure ramesh is back here to go in for and uh, go in an emergency um, oh. uh, thing to see uh, so do we have any questions everybody is saying great talk here um, and everybody is so full of praises i think you have covered everything you've gone from uh, the history all the way to what's happening in the in the modern era and it's wonderful to go through so basically for you if you see an adult and pediatric patient um, what is your management difference between the two i i think uh, today my first uh, uh, impulse uh, or first uh, uh, thing which i think of whenever i see a craniopharyngioma patient is would i be able to help this patient uh, uh, by surgery uh, and uh, radical surgery would be better or not once we have made these two uh, decisions very clearly then the approach and as i said whenever possible whenever there is a corridor and if the tumor is not too calcified uh, or there is paracellular extension i would uh, suggest a trans nasal end, endonasal transpenoidal approach whenever that is not possible we uh, would opt for some sort of a craniotomy and right now terianal craniotomy remains my uh, procedure of choice because it allows you to use all corridors uh, quite effectively um, have you tried the subfrontal approach and eyebrow approach did that in any way help i, <laughs> I have actually published a uh, uh, eyebrow approach uh, in about eight uh, patients uh, uh, about 20 years ago uh when i was doing transcranial surgery and i first shifted from perioneal to uh, uh, uh supraorbital approach but basically i think uh, uh the kind of tumors now we are doing transcranially uh i think the eyebrow approach would be difficult though it is it is remains a good approach if you decide to do a transcranial approach and if you are familiar with it i think it's a good approach. Okay, so Anwarul Haq is asking, what is the treatment for hypothalamic obesity? Unfortunately, there is no treatment for hypothalamic obesity. Uh, hypothalamic obesity, it seems plateaus after about 10 years or so, but those first 10 years can be terrible, not only for the child, but for the whole family. And it can have devastating effects, uh, you know, uh, and... Uh, person can get into so many uh, other uh, metabolic and endocrinological problems but unfortunately there there is very little in terms of uh, active treatment for this let your take on this well <laughs> my friend that that, that was an extraordinary lecture Re really i enjoyed that uh, very much uh, chandra i would like to ask you one thing 
uh, the higher the lesion is positioned, the lower you need the approach. Absolutely. To get a good angle. Uh, I saw yes. that uh, your cases were done uh, by pterional, which I love because I believe that pterional is a working horse and you can do anything from that. Have you ever used Ozzy? Right. Uh, uh, I, I think this is a very good question uh, which you are asking. Uh, Orbitozygomatic approach is something which we used to do very, very regularly for several uh, 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 things earlier. But I find that except for meningioma, in a tumor like craniopharyngioma, which can be decompressed and where you can mobilize the tumor, you probably do not need that. You can get tumor in your angle rather than going. I think for a meningioma, I would go for a OZ. For a craniopharyngioma, I, I may have done a couple of cases earlier, but uh, uh, not in last 15 years. Thank you. Sorry, Vlad, why did you ask? Uh, because I wouldn't think you'd need an OZ for craniopharyngioma. Did, is there any particular reason you were asking? No, no, no. I'm, uh, uh, there was a reason because uh, craniopharyngioma tend to grow upwards, quite a, you, you know, into the third ventricle. And uh, the other indication for OZ going higher up would be basilar tip aneurysm, which is, uh, let's say, more than 15 millimeters above the posterior clinoids. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> I really hate OZ because I believe that that is the approach by which you can endanger the patient sometimes more than by surgery itself. And I want him to he hear <laughs> something like that. Uh, from a really experienced uh, guy like Chandra because he really knows his job perfectly and uh, uh, I somehow got it confirmed that he doesn't like Ozzy that much as well but still using it. No, I think even for schwannomas, I mean uh, uh, for trigeminal schwannomas we are not doing, uh, not taking out zygoma anymore, you know, whenever you can decompress the tumor and one good thing about craniopharyngioma is that top of the lesion is usually the dome of the cyst. So that that collapses uh, when you True. start uh, draining the tumor. And yes. therefore, you don't need to. But yes, in a solid tumor going into the third ventricle, I mean, sometimes for a giant pituitary, you need to do that, I suppose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was Chandra, what about that we the... hardly have anything to say. You, you know. It's... <laughs> Sorry? Is no, there a question? I, I said that uh, your, your lecture was so exhaustive that one would like to see it, have it on a paper in front of himself just to read it because then you know everything about the craniopharyngiomas. You covered all angels and uh, all aspects of this uh, formidable tumor. Okay, uh, uh, Imad, can you show us um, uh, the MCQs? And just last question, we're doing these MCQs, he's bringing the MCQs up. Uh, how about calcification? If you have calcification, would you go endoscopic or microscopic? Right, so I think calcification is also, sometimes it is just lining the cyst wall, then it does not really matter what approach you are doing and endonasal is uh, fairly safe. If you have a calcification mainly in the cella, as you have seen in a couple of patients, uh, I have uh, tried to show videos. And if it is amorphous, then also it is okay. You, you can usually get it out with your suction, a little bit of curating, though I don't like to use curates anymore, uh, but with some kind of a dissector. But if you have a hard rock, like, I mean, if, if you are seeing a chunk of calcification, on a CT scan, then I am very reluctant to do it because of only one reason. The biggest problem with endonasal approach today is that if you have a vascular injury, you, you have very little chance of salvaging the patient unless you have an interventionist available to you immediately. Uh, and therefore, I do not want to take a chance. Okay, um, Chandra, this is yours. Yeah. So, so we were talking about adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma and uh, the options given were they are more common in adults, they are less prone to recurrence, they are associated with beta-catenin mutation, none of the above and all of the above. 
the obvious answer is none of the above but unfortunately only 15.9% have answered it correctly so i am sure uh, uh, is is that correct or have i got it is it all of the above or none of the above can i just go back once less prone more prone to recurrence associated with beta catenin no so we had only one correct answer that was associated with beta catenin mutation that has been given by 22.4% people which is the second largest sorry uh, that was the correct answer and it has been given by about 22% people but i am sure it is a very new information and uh, hopefully uh, after the talk it would be easier for people to get that <laughs> okay next intraventricular craniopharyngeomas uh, most frequent subtype best approach by endonasal approach most commonly present with visual field defect none of the above and i think which is right answer and it has been given by the majority 40% that's that's good and uh, the resectivity depends uh, he has put a p there but <laughs> i think yes we must give respect to it uh calcification adherence to the hypothalamus prefix chiasm all of the above none of the above and it is obviously all of the above and majority has got it right so that's that's one uh, very good uh, answer very good so that's uh, excellent amad do we have other mcqs yes sir uh, glad there are questions on cavernomas yeah, yeah i see all right the yearly risk of bleeding in lower cavernoma 1 2 3 4 5% <laughs> it's uh, majority is uh, re replied correctly it's 1% or even less than 1% the, the, the last figure i've seen was 0.8 so this is the correct answer okay okay the yearly risk of bleeding from brain stem one through three, it's completely wrong. The correct answer is D, six through 36. But you see that it's overlapping and that the, the figures is in a wide, wide range. So we do not know correctly, but what's recently accepted most is six through 36 with one fifth. Why, why is that, Vlad? I don't know. I don't know. The, those, those, that, that was the lowest figure I have found was 6% uh, yearly risk. And the highest figure I have found was 36% risk. Uh, but okay. uh, I don't think that we can be uh, dogmatic about it and we can be talking about the uh, exact figure. We probably uh, should uh, uh, realize The that, Japanese uh, have reported 30% plus. I think uh, uh, the Japanese, ca yeah, the Japanese cavernoma group have reported the highest rate of bleeding, which exceeds 30%. Rest of the world statistics, as far as the Lancet uh, uh, analysis goes, is about twenty odd percent. Right. So, but uh, I I believe that the range is really that big that uh, only the lowest number, the the the, the blue color, is uh, is wrong. Anything else uh, is uh, virtually <laughs> correct. Yeah. It's high actually. Okay, in case of five lower cover normal, the treatment should be resect all observation, resect the symptomatic one, and that's the correct answer. Yeah. And it was answered correctly by major majority of, of uh, people. So this is okay. okay. And look for venous anomaly in all cases, ventricular ones. Well, this was easy question. This is correct. Look it for in all cases. Okay. Okay. And this is the last I get the best timing of surgery. And it's uh, in a way a little bit subjective from my point of view because it's still a matter of discussion. But uh, in my mind, C is correct 10 to 14 days after the bleeding. Don't wait much longer and don't do it as an emergency.
but quite a few people will do it as an emergency, I see, or urgent. Well, well, I, I think, Vlad, I think when the, the rationale for doing it as an emergency is the patient's already got deficit. You know that most of this brainstem carcinoma, they tend to recover after some time. Exactly. Depending on the patient's course and depending on the, on, the, on the clinical symptoms, of course. If the patient is deteriorating and he gets got a fresh bleeding, I, of course, would do it as an emergency also. So it's... I have, uh, I tried to show last time, uh, I have two patients, one with brainstem and one with cerebellar cavernomas, who actually deteriorated uh, 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 during waiting for surgery. And then they had to be taken up as an emergency. Sometimes you can exactly. have a progressive neurological deficit because of yeah. uh, the yeah. hematoma enlarging, like you can get yeah. anywhere, I suppose. I had a patient very, very rare. Only two patients. who bled during the night before surgery. You know, he was scheduled for surgery in the morning and he bled during the night. So he went for emergency surgery and it was a pontine cavernoma. Uh, he came into the OR with Glasgow coma. Six and uh, severe quadriparesis, and actually he didn't recover fully, but he he is leading an independent life, so it's really not dogmatic that you should wait. Of course, of course. Okay, next. And pontine cavernoma should be in superior inferior. That's not sufficient. Anterior posterior, of course not. Midline lateral. Of course not, and fourth ventricle deep in the, of course not. So the correct answer is upper, middle, and lower. And this relates to the approach mostly, and it's correct answer. 44% answered correctly. Brilliant, that was very good. Uh, Ramesh, Ramesh, do you want to wrap it up? Well, just one second, we can have a group photograph with everybody's video on. Can we have a group photograph, please? And uh, sorry, so we have, um, oh, what is this? Okay, we have um, uh, Danny Pavardello talking about principles, tricks of uh, posterior fossa and nasal surgery. That's going to be interesting. And uh, so posterior fossa and nasal surgery. And then skull-based lesions, Azmi uh, is uh, going to be giving a talk. We have Henry Schroeder and Moody uh, moderating this session. And we have this, uh, when is this anyway, 27th July. Uh, this is too far away. We on this coming Saturday, we have the neuroanatomy. Do you have a post for that, Imad? Um, no, sir. No, okay. So we, ha we have Pablo uh, doing as usual. And uh, Yasser Kaiber, our, our chief resident, is going to be, um, as always, um, uh, presenting and we are going to be going and talking about insula so it's it's all going to be uh, detail about insula i'd suggest uh, the trainees who are who have gone through the white matter dissection with us the talks on that fine if you haven't then go on to the lnh neurosurgery youtube site and look at the white matter uh, dissection talk because then it will make it easier for you because we will be going into detail from then onward so it would be a good revision and then uh, we, go, we only talk about insula in that one and a half hour session. All right. Uh, yeah, and also, yeah, as yeah. always, Ramesh, uh, Vlad, uh, the Pujari, you guys are, as always, most welcome as experts to uh, tell us what we are doing wrong or what we should do right. Ramesh, all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Salman. And uh, I um, uh, thank you. Thank the, um, the speakers today. The, They've been great and brilliant presentation, comprehensive cover of uh, cavernomas as well as the craniopharyngiomas. I do hope that um, we can go back and listen to these talks again because it's quite a, such a resourceful talk. Um, and um, once again, thank Talman uh, and the Pakistan Society of Neurosurgery for organizing these talks. It's been growing, going great. And I hope that um, this will go on for a long, long time. <laughs> Okay, guys, thank you. It was brilliant having thanks, you all. And thank thanks, Ramesh. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. thanks Ramesh. Thanks, Salman. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Great. Thank you. Bye -bye. Great.